Good evening, everyone. Your FAFSA is done, right? And now it's time for us to show you the money. Well, maybe there might be a couple more steps you need to take. So that's what tonight is all about. We want to make sure you qualify for all the financial aid that um, is available to you. So we're going to share some pro tips with you tonight that you won't want to miss. So we are glad you are here. Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. Tonight is part of the How to Pay for College series. This one is FAFSA's Done, Show Me the Money, which is part three of our four-part series. I'm your host, Kathy Hastings McDonald, Associate Director for Outreach for the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority. A couple of housekeeping items to get us started while people are making their way into our virtual room. First, we welcome your questions. I'm going, going to ask that you use the question box for tonight so that we can keep track of your questions as they come through. Many of you may be familiar with Zoom and used to using chat, but I'm going to ask you to use the, the Q&A because that way we can, we've got some folks working behind the scenes to help answer your questions. So we want to make sure we can see what's on your mind. Next, we love for you to share what you're learning on social media, help your friends learn more about ways to pay for college too. Please use the hashtag CFNC so we can find you. And finally, we are recording tonight's session. Uh, we could ask that a lot. So yes, you will be able to refer back to tonight's session. We'll post this session to listen to later on the CFNC.org pay webpage, but we'll also be putting it on YouTube as well. Now, first up, we want to get to know a little bit more about you all. So we want to get a sense of who's on the call with us tonight. So if you can chime in, are you a parent, a student, a school counselor or district staff, a college access nonprofit member, or maybe other? I'm always curious about our other people. Give us a couple more seconds. Okay. Okay, let, let me show you all. So for the most part, it's parents on the call tonight. Welcome, we're excited to have you. Students, welcome. And school counselor and other district, um, district folks, welcome to you as well. We're excited to have you all in it's helpful for us to know as part of, um, you know, figuring out the remarks that we're going to share with you tonight. Okay, I have one more poll for you before while we get started. Let's go back to my menu here. Okay, we want to know where you are on your college going journey. Are you a soon to be first year college student or the parent of one? Are you a graduate student? Are you, a, I, this one, I think you can answer multiple things. Are you a returning adult student or a student or parent of a student who is a jun, in junior year of high school or um, younger or other? Let's just give you a couple more seconds here. Yeah. Okay, I think we're I think we're done collecting. So let's share that. So most of you are uh, soon to be a first year college student or the parent of one. Great, and then some of you are parents of students who are younger than that. Great. So that's super helpful for us. So um, we know again what remarks to share with you all. Okay, thanks for participating, everyone. We appreciate that. Okay, so next up, just, just to give you a quick, you know, so you know who's putting this webinar on. This webinar is brought to you by the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority, which is the state agency that helps North Carolina students plan and pay for their education. We're pleased to bring you the CFNC.org website where you can go for everything you need to know about the college going process, which you can see there on your screen, all of those steps, you can find information and really helpful resources there on, on the page. So I, I encourage you if you haven't been to the website to check that out. 
A quick reminder of where we've been for the last couple of weeks, the three main ways to pay for college. Uh, it, for those of you who may not have seen the, the first session, there's three main ways to pay for college, family funds, financial aid, and gap funding. Over 85% of students who are in their first year, who are going to college for the first time, use some combination of federal, state, and college-based aid to pay for college. So financial aid is a big, big piece of the how to pay for college puzzle. Tonight, we'll talk about um, what you need to be aware of after your FAFSA is done um, so that, again, you make sure you qualify for all the financial aid uh, that's available to you. So I am going to ask you another poll. All right, let's go back here. And you have two questions this time. The first question is, have you completed your FAFSA? Yes, no, or you're not sure. And the second question is, if not, why not? So if you can chime in there, we'd love to see where you're at in this financial aid process. Yeah, a couple more seconds to answer here. Okay. All right, let me go ahead and launch that. So more than half of you have not completed your FAFSA yet. So we're gonna encourage you to do that tonight. Um, and then second, why not? We got a lot of others. So I would love if you'd put in the Q&A what your other is, because we would love to know what, um, what's keeping you from filling that out. OK, so let me, let me stop out of there. Thanks for participating in that. That's super helpful. And with that, I am super excited to welcome Lee Bray with us tonight. She is the Director of Financial Aid for Pitt Community College. And Lee, after people complete the FAFSA, there's definitely still some steps that can trip people up. And so I'm so excited that you're here to help us walk through that. And sometimes families have such financial situations that change. So I know you're gonna help um, our families know tonight what to do if that happens as well. So welcome, and I am gonna stop sharing. Uh, actually, uh, do you, yeah, you're going to share your own slides. So let me stop sharing so you can share your slides. Yeah, I'll take over. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, this is, I always just relish getting an opportunity to talk about financial aid um, and, you know, what's needed. A lot of individuals usually think that once the FAFSA is completed, that you're, you're done. And that's not always the case. There's a lot of follow-up that's needed. Um, and so I love that we did the poll because it kind of gives me uh, an idea of what exactly I need to share with all of you. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about tonight is uh, after you have already filled out the FAFSA, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to you. This is all going to make sense. So I'm going to jump right into my presentation because I know that you'll have a bunch of questions at the end. Okay, so again, my name is Lee Bray. I'm the Director of Financial Aid over here at Pitt Community College. And um, I have worked in financial aid now for uh, going on 16 years. I've worked at four-year schools, two-year schools, public, private. Um, so I'd like to think that I have a wealth of knowledge that I, I just love to share with you all. Uh, so once you actually complete the FAFSA, you are going to get a summary of the FAFSA and all the information that you filled out. And that is something that everyone refers to as a SAR. Uh, we use the acronym, acronym SAR. Um, it stands for Student Aid Report. Uh, that's just a very fancy way for us to say it's a summary that you receive uh, based on the information that you input on the FAFSA. Depending on whether you put an email address on the FAFSA or not is depends on how you actually receive that student aid report. Um, typically, it's either emailed to you directly or it's physically mailed to you, and that takes about three to 10 days once the FAFSA is processed. Um, and that's something that I want to mention too. 
when you hit submit on the FAFSA button, that does not mean it's automatically sent to the schools and that it's processed. Um, there is still a lot of background information and checks and balances that need to be run by the Department of Education um, before your FAFSA is actually considered what we call processed. Um, so we'd like to say that once you hit submit on the FAFSA, it takes about three to five days for that to occur. So the student aid report, it's really important that you look at it because uh, it can give you a, a lot of great information uh, up front before the schools that you're interested in contact you. So the first thing um, and probably the most important thing is going to be what we call the EFC or expected family or estimated family contribution. That number, that EFC is what tells school officials like myself, how much financial aid, state grants, and other funding that we can award you. So that number plays an important role for on our end. Um, next on your SAR, your student aid report, uh, there will be a list of items that you may or may not need to resolve so that the school can be able to process your information. Uh, most of the time, it's is there a missing signature page, or maybe there is some, um, you know, pretty obvious discrepancies in the FAFSA that you might want to take care of uh, before the school even gets to review the information. The other items that are on the SAR, uh, one important thing would be a DRN or a data release number. This is important if you're putting multiple schools onto your FAFSA or if you forget to put a school onto your FAFSA. So for example, let's say you filled out your FAFSA because you were planning on attending East Carolina University, which is right next door to me, but then decided to go to Pitt, but you did not put Pitt on your FAFSA. So I can't see your information. Well, if you need help, adding a school onto your FAFSA, if you provide that DRN number, it's a four digit number. If you provide that number to me, I can actually enter that and gain access to your FAFSA and help make those changes for you. So sometimes when students come into my office and say, you know, I don't know why you didn't get my FAFSA. I did it a while ago. It's usually because they don't have our school on it. And if I'm able to get that DRN number, then I can help you out right while you're here in my office. Uh, other important information, I know that there are a lot of first time students or just a lot of parents on the call. Uh, so this may or may not apply, but if, if you have ever borrowed any student loans, federal student loans or federal grants or gotten them for school, there will be a history that shows up on that student aid report. So you can kind of see if you've gone to other schools before. Probably the most important thing that you all will want to know about your student aid report is what estimate of federal funding you're about to receive. It's important to know that this is an estimate. Um, you know, the, your FAFSA may not be complete, the school may need to make corrections to it, but on your student aid report, and I'll, I'll show you this on the next screen, it'll give you a good indication of whether you're going to be grant eligible. I do want to make you aware that the FAFSA is your, the, the estimate of eligibility that they will show on your FAFSA is just going to be for federal funds. Because um, the federal funds are the same process across, across the nation, but state funds and institutional funds are obviously something that the Department of Education can't estimate for you. So I don't want you to think that when you view your student aid report, it may say, you know, you're only eligible for student loans. That might not be the case. Um, you still want to wait till your award letter from the actual school comes but sometimes this can give you a really good idea of what you might be eligible for. 
And the last thing um, that's pretty important to know, the student aid report will let you know if you're selected for a process called verification. And I'm actually gonna talk a whole lot about that later because you may or may not have heard about that already. Okay, so what we're gonna look at now is what your student aid report actually looks like. The student aid report, this is an electronic version of my student aid report, uh, just so I can use myself as some examples. Um, but the student aid report in the electronic version is very, very, very long. So I apologize about the way the screenshots are, um, but I tried to pack in and cut and paste what I thought was uh, most important for you all to, to look at when you're, you're looking at your student aid report. So the first thing on the screen on the left-hand side, uh, when you actually log on to studentaid.gov and you see that your FAFSA is processed, there are uh, three additional actions that you can take. And you can see that I've circled the one that says view your student aid report or your SAR. So that's what I did here. I clicked on that and it brought me over into the screenshot on the right hand side. And the processing results are where you're going to find the bulk of the information that I just gave to you on the previous slide. Um, you will know whether you're selected for verification because there will be a little asterisk uh, by the process date and there will be an explanation. That DRN number I talked about is right up there in the top right hand side. And then you can see on the screen, I in the big circle, um, my estimated or expected family contribution is zero. You may or may not be able to read it, but then underneath, it actually says that I'm not eligible for the federal Pell Grant. Now, this is because one of the questions that I answered on the FAFSA was, do I already have a bachelor's degree? I do, and that makes me ineligible for any type of federal grants. But for your reference, this is where you would see an estimate of the student loans and any grants, um, as far as federal grants, the Pell Grant that you'd be eligible for. But what I wanna point out here, a lot of students, you have your parents filling out the form for you. And I see a lot on my end where the parents kind of forget that they're answering the information about the student and will answer some of these questions about themselves directly. So we do see a lot of students who, are, who will select, I already have a bachelor's degree or I have children I support when that's not actually the case, that's actually the parents' answers. So if for some reason, you know, you come to your student aid report to see what you're eligible for and you take a look at that expected family contribution and it's zero, which means you are fully grant eligible and it tells you you're not, you might wanna go check with the school because uh, there might be something that we need to resolve on our end. All right, so now we get into the nitty gritty. Um, the FAFSA is very, very, very intuitive. I know it may not seem like it. I know it seems like a ton of information, but a lot of the information that will pull up on your student aid report, you may not have actually seen these questions. Now on the left-hand side of your screen, um, these are all questions you do see. It's about demographic information. Um, obviously I didn't put mine up here, but where you live, what address you put, what's your email address, are you a citizen, marital status? Um, those kinds of questions you will have seen when you filled out the FAFSA. And then on the right-hand side, I only listed Pitt Community College as a school but you would be able to see any of the schools that you listed and even blank spots for spots that you didn't use for schools on your FAFSA and your housing plans for the schools that you selected. What you kind of see next on your student aid report are those odd questions that the FAFSA asks to determine whether we need to look at parental information. This is what we call dependency status. 
So um, I hope that you're all aware by this point in the series that uh, typically students who are under the age of 24 are still considered dependent on their, parent, on their parents, which means that the FAFSA will ask for parental information. I am over the age of 24, so the first question asks about age. And so my answer to that question is it actually automatically populated to yes, based on my birth date. And for me specifically, I only had to ask or answer uh, where you see four no's. Those are the only additional questions that popped up for me uh, because when I met that age requirement on the FAFSA, it just bypassed all the other information. Um, but it does still want to know, do I support children? Do I support any other dependents? Um, and I'm going to talk a, a more um, later in my slides about what, what we call dependency overrides. But initially on the FAFSA, when you're entering your dependency status, most of these questions for you, um, for the parents that are on the call and the students that are first year students, it's probably going to be all no's. So now, when, when the FAFSA has determined that you are a dependent student, it will then ask for your parents' information. And again, since I am over the age of 24, this still pops up on my student aid report, but you can tell it's kind of like the, the information is a little grayed and there's no answers on the, on the column by the questions. It's because, like I said, the student aid report will show you every question on the FAFSA. But when I was actually completing this, the FAFSA was smart enough to see that I'm 24 years old and I don't need to enter parental information. So it skipped all of this for me, um, which is one of the good things about the FAFSA, but it can make the student aid report a little confusing to read. So I just wanna let you know again that there are going to be a lot of questions that you see on the student aid report that you never saw on the actual FAFSA, and that's okay. Um, so I know that um, you have actually talked a lot about the FAFSA previously, so you should be familiar with all the parental demographics and the financial information that it asks for. Um, but this is just a little screenshot of some of the things that they ask for, not all of them. Um, I did not put this next screen in, but if I were showing you a full student aid report, the next se section would be student information and student financials. So, and it would ask the same questions. I unfortunately was not gonna show you my student financials, so you don't get to see that part. But what I did show you um, on the left-hand side of the screen, um, I did show you a little bit of the student portion because uh, they talk about asset information. Um, and I know that um, I believe Amy had answered a question in the chat already. Um, assets uh, are something that get very confusing on the FAFSA. Um, when the FAFSA asks for assets, it does not mean your um, like the car that you own or the home that you live in, even though in the regular world that is considered an asset, uh, they only mean a home as an asset if it's like a beach house that you have. Um, but anytime on the FAFSA when you are unsure of what exactly that they are asking for, there's, little, um, there's a little question mark with a circle around it where you can get a deeper explanation of what the question actually is. Um, and especially with that asset one, because probably the biggest mistake that I see is individuals putting the value of their only home or um, like their retirement funds and stuff like that. And normally that does not count. Um, so then uh, on the bottom of the left-hand side, you can see their signature information. Uh, I actually was able to sign electronically because I had used that FSA user ID and password. But if for some reason it was missing uh, a parent signature or a student signature, it would notify you here. And that would also be an item that you would need to resolve 
um, before the financial aid offices would be able to process it. I told you this student aid report is just, whew, it's super long. Okay, so on the right-hand side of the screen, then we're coming to the end of the student aid report. Um, and right at the end of the student aid report, it wants to give you information about the schools that you put onto your FAFSA. Um, so like I said, I put Pitt Community College just because I was testing it. And at the bottom, you see that there is graduation, transfer, and retention rates. This is something that you want to look at um, when you're making decisions about the schools that you want to go to. Um, obviously, you want a school that has a good reputation, that you know students aren't dropping out, that they're graduating from. Those are all very important things to look at. Now, when you look at Pitt Community College, we're a transfer school. So it makes very much sense that our graduation rate is low because the intent is for students just to kind of stop here on their way to a four-year school. That's why our retention rate and our transfer rate is higher than our graduation rate. But these numbers um, are very, very important when you're looking into, uh, if you're deciding between multiple schools. And then um, if you, uh, at the bottom in that blue box, it'll actually tell you how you can update college information if, like let's say the scenario I said before where you come to Pitt Community College and you think you put us on your FAFSA, um, but we don't have it, you can go to your student aid report, see what schools are on there, and see, oh yeah, I didn't put Pitt Community College, but then in that little blue box, it tells you exactly how to do it and where to go. Okay, so moving on from the student aid report, I wanna talk to you about a process that we call verification. Um, and this is everything that I'm talking about, just because I work at the community college, this applies to every school nationwide. So this is very applicable. Um, but like I said, when you hit submit on the FAFSA, you're not actually done um, until the school sends you an offer letter or what we call an award letter. You may or may not still have some work to do. Uh, and oftentimes the school will reach out to you and say that you were selected for a process called verification. Um, this can be a very scary thing because just like the FAFSA, uh, a lot of what we as a school ask for is repetitive information. So we often ask for um, the students' taxes or parents' taxes. We might ask for who all lives in the household, their names and their ages and whether they go to school. And um, sometimes we ask about that untaxed uh, income information or your asset information. We might even ask about marital documents, citizenship documents, or identity documents like a valid driver's license to prove that you're who you are. The main thing that I wanna, want you to take away about verification is it is absolutely nothing that you did wrong. Um, it is nothing wrong whatsoever. Verification is a totally random process and the Department of Education randomly selects FAFSAs and then tells us which FAFSAs to select for verification and which ones not to. Um, typically, as a school, we have about 30% of our FAFSAs get selected for verification. I think it's a little higher because a lot of my students are grant eligible. And it kind of makes sense, you know, if you're eligible for federal money, you're probably going to be selected for verification. That's how I think of it. Uh, some schools also will select all of their students for verification. Um, so I want you to be aware that it is a very, very common practice in our world, and it does not mean anything you did was incorrect. What we are doing, all of the information that we will ask for we actually just go on to your FAFSA and we verify that everything you put there is correct. And if it's not correct, we change it for you. So there's no harm done. No one gets in trouble or anything. 
we just make all those corrections for you as a school so you don't have to worry about it. But again, some things that I want to make you aware of with verification, not everyone will be selected. I have seen it where I have had twin siblings uh, that came to my school. One was selected, one wasn't, and they both had different grant eligibility. That can very, very, very often happen um, where one student's financial aid is not the same as another's. It almost never is. Um, one other important thing I wanna point out to you, unless the school sp specifically tells you to go on and correct your FAFSA, don't correct it. We will correct it for you or reach out to us before you correct it. What happens is when students go onto their FAFSA and make a significant amount of changes, it'll eventually stop you from making any changes and then the school has to get involved. Um, I at Pitt, I prefer that we collect the documents and we make changes for you because it's easier for you um, and it's less confusing so that when I see multiple FAFSAs for a student, I don't have to wonder whether the first change you made was correct or the second change you made was correct. I consider that what's called conflicting information. And so making corrections on your FAFSA can oftentimes lead the schools to asking you for these verification documents. So I think it's very, very important that unless the school specifically directs you or like it's a missing signature page um, that you need to send in, um, don't make any changes to the FAFSA unless we direct you to. The other thing that I wanna make note of, just like I told you hitting submit on the FAFSA is not the last step. If you're coming to a school and the school asks you for your parents' taxes, at that point in time, that might be the only thing that the school needs. And a lot of things that we look at will prompt more questions. And again, that's nothing that you did wrong. It's just sometimes how the process works. But I don't want you to think that, um, again, if you just turn in one document, that that's it, the process is done. Remember, the not completely done with the FAFSA until you actually receive your offer letter. So I know it seems like we should be able to ask for all that information up front, but sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we make a correction to your FAFSA and then the FAFSA comes back and tells us to ask for something different. Or sometimes we take a look at your taxes and we're not tax professionals. So sometimes we ask you to clarify information for us. So again, it's nothing that you're doing wrong. Um, it's just the process that uh, the Department of Education has us go through on um, our procedures. Uh, the other thing that I wanna let you know, and I have this conversation with parents mostly, your information is, it's safe. Uh, we have to adhere by some very strict federal regulations in our office and with our computer systems so that uh, because we are receiving some very sensitive tax and biographical information on all of you. Um, so we adhere to some very strict standards. Uh, I also wanna let you know, uh, sometimes the argument I get from parents is that they don't wanna provide their information for students because um, they don't want to be responsible for the student's schooling or paying for school. And you don't have to. The FAFSA and your information is solely used to determine what grants and loans and other financial aid the student is eligible for. Um, if you ever have any questions or concerns about your information or what we're asking you to provide, come talk to the school. Um, we have these conversations all the time. Um, and most of the time that I see the parents just don't like their students to have the information and don't worry, they can't do anything with it anyway, so. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is another process that us as financial aid administrators call professional judgment. So the FAFSA, um, like you all have learned about, looks 
looks at information at very weird times. So the information that you're entering as far as demographic information, that's all information that's accurate as of the day that you're completing the FAFSA. But when it gets to financials, they're asking for everything two years in arrears or two years prior. We call it prior, prior year. Well, I don't know about you all, but I mean, everything changed two years ago. So your tax information from uh, what, oh gosh, what tax year are you using on this new FAFSA? They're gonna ask for 2021. Your tax information on 2021 might be different than the financial situation that you're in when you're actually completing the FAFSA. You still have to enter your 2021 taxes or whatever year it's asking for, but as a school, we are given the authority to make professional judgments or make corrections to your FAFSA outside of our normal procedures um, to best show your financial situation as it is currently or in the future. So we don't always have to look two years behind. That's just the standard. But again, not everyone fits into that standard where two years ago is an accurate description of what you're doing now. So um, I wanna talk, tell you about the possible scenarios and then I'll talk about who to contact and things like that. So the biggest, professional judgment that we as a school get asked for is for income adjustments. Because again, two years is a lot of time for your financial information to change. I see a lot of people with one-time payments, um, pulling out retirement money just for one year. Uh, you get an inheritance, you have gambling winnings, um, things like that, that may make you grant ineligible one year but if we look at a different year of financial information, it may make you grant eligible. But we are not mind readers. I do not know that any student who walks through my door has a different financial situation now than they had two years ago. So it's very important that the first thing that you have to do is get the FAFSA submitted. Because again, we can make all the changes on the back end. Once it's submitted, there's like, you don't have to worry that it can't ever be changed again. We can make adjustments if needed, but we don't automatically know to do them. Um, so income adjustments, or sometimes I project future income. Sometimes I will take just the prior year taxes, which might be a more accurate depiction of your finances. Uh, it all depends. Other scenarios, um, we can increase our cost of attendance. We set a budget at the schools for every student. Um, the best way for me to say it is that so students don't over borrow. We set a budget for every student that includes estimated costs for tuition fees, room, board, meals, um, those direct costs that you might get from the school, and we also know that you need to pay for books, supplies, transportation, um, miscellaneous expenses, and a whole, a whole range of other things actually go into a student's uh, cost of attendance. If for some reason you, are, you or your student are limited on the financial aid that they're receiving and you need more funding, you can talk to the school about making an adjustment to the cost of attendance. Here at Pitt, I like to say this, our costs are so low that we don't ever have this problem. Uh, I think I've only done a cost of attendance adjustment once and while I've been here, and it was for a student who they paid a lot in rent. Um, and we only budget, um, I think it's about $3,800 per semester uh, for a three month period for students. But this student was paying about $2,500 in rent, which was something I've never seen in this area. And so what I did was I just had the student show me proof of their lease and how much their rent was. 
I took that number and divided it or, or multiplied it by 12 months out of the year. And then I was able to increase their budget so that I could provide them student loans so that they could cover their housing costs with their student loans. It's not something that normally happens, but um, it does happen. Dependency overrides. Um, I know there is probably a significant amount of you on this call that have questions about, uh, can my student file the FAFSA on their own? I don't wanna be on there, or I am a guardian, um, or I'm an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent. I do not have legal custody of my dependent. There are a host of scenarios where you don't fall into that perfect, yes, you're dependent or you're independent from your parents. And the FAFSA, again, uses the age threshold of 24 or older when you are independent. So if you don't fall into the, any of the other dependency categories, and for some reason, you cannot provide parental information on the FAFSA, you can contact the school. And this is a case where sometimes we reach out to you depending on how you answer the FAFSA, but we do have a process called a dependency override where we will review your situation as it stands to see whether we can allow the student's information to solely be on the FAFSA or whether we still need parental information on there. I wanna make it clear though, even though the schools have the authority to do a dependency override, the one regulation that we have to abide by is we can't do dependency overrides and leave out parent information just because the student does live on their own and, and has a job and provides from them for themselves. If the student is under the age of 24, um, parents have to be on there. Um, dependency overrides are reserved for scenarios where um, the student was adopted after a certain age, uh, the student is considered homeless. Um, what are some other ones? There is a legal guardian or someone has legal custody over the child. The child might have been in foster care. Um, parents are incapacitated. Parents' whereabouts are unknown. Parents are deceased. Um, parents are physically incapable um, of providing their information. Like if there is incarceration or substance abuse issues, those are what we reserve dependency overrides for. The other professional judgments that I just wanna let you know about is if you make a mistake to the FAFSA, like I said, don't try to go correct it on your own. Come talk to the school. We can make those corrections for you. Um, a lot of times I see people that enter an extra zero and they didn't realize it. Well, usually I just need some kind of document on the back end so that I can show the Department of Ed, this is why I made this change, but we can make those changes for you. And it falls within that scope of what we consider professional judgment. So the biggest thing though, and I think I've mentioned it a few times, who do you contact? This is always gonna be the school. And again, it only the only times that the school will reach out to you um, is possibly for a dependency override. And even that, it all depends on the, the way you answer questions on the FAFSA. So if you think that there's something wrong or if you want something changed or if you just need to review your FAFSA, go to the school and contact the financial aid office because that's what we're here for. That's what we do all day long. Um, but like I said, we don't know your income changed or something has changed in your situation unless you tell us. Also, Keep in mind that we're audited by the Department of Education. So anytime that we do anything on our end, we've got to document it. So if you are doing a dependency override, there's documentation. We just can't take your word on some things, even though if it were up to me, I would just let everything go through and not worry about it. But we ask for documents so that if we are ever audited by the Department of Education, and someone pulls your file, I can say, I did this professional judgment 
because this is the document that I received and they won't even look twice. They will say, okay, you did your job, you're good to go. But if as a school, we make a change to your FAFSA and we don't document it, then we get, we get slapped on the wrist, not you guys, just us. But so that's why um, if a school continually asks for tax documents or marital documents um, or anything of that sort, that's usually what it's for. It's for our documentation and processing purposes. Okay, so you have finished the process. You have completed the FAFSA. You have reviewed your student aid report. Now what happens? There's a couple of things that I wanna let you know, and I know I'm running out of time here, but uh, the first thing is the school is gonna communicate with the student directly. We will not communicate with the parents um, unless by some chance the school that you're interested in mails things home, but we are required to communicate with the student for privacy reasons. We will also do that through the school issued email. So it's very important that once you get accepted to the school that you plan on attending, that you set up your email account and you check that school email account regularly. Um, what's gonna happen is the school is most likely going to email you your offer letter or award letter, or we're gonna email you about other documents that we might need. And we're gonna email you repeatedly because we want you to get financial aid. So don't worry, we're gonna reach out. But if for some reason you don't have access to your school email or you're having trouble with it and you're not sure of where you're at in the FAFSA process, just come see a financial aid office, email us, call us, any of the schools will be willing to help you out. There's also maybe some additional documents that you need to complete even if you got your award letter. So let's say you are interested in taking out student loans. Uh, well, student loans may be on your award letter, but there's additional documents that you need to complete in order to take advantage of those student loans. So that information will be communicated to you. So you wanna make sure you're on the lookout for that. Most of the time for student loans, because it's a loan and they wanna make sure you understand that you have to repay a loan, they make you fill out a master promissory note and what's called entrance counseling. Entrance counseling teaches you all about student loans and the ins and outs. And the master promissory note is a contract to repay the loan, just like you would have a car note. It's the exact same thing. Uh, the other thing that you wanna be aware of is you don't, if you're eligible for financial aid, you can dip into that to use at the bookstore. Um, almost every school that I'm aware of around the nation allows you to dip in to your financial aid at least 10 days before the semester starts so that you can buy your books and not have to pay out of pocket. Here at Pitt, um, we use your student ID number to in the bookstore, your student ID number will give the bookstore access to your financial aid so that they know how much you can charge. Some schools will give you a debit card. Uh, some schools it will automatically be applied to your account. But either way, you can charge books at the bookstore if you have any sort of financial aid on your account and it's over and above your tuition and fees. The other question that I get asked quite frequently is how do I take the financial aid that I'm eligible for and apply it to my tuition? This is a very good question. And I sometimes forget that I work so deeply in financial aid. As long as you accept your financial aid, which will be communicated to you in your award letter, whether you have to accept it or not, that financial aid, we automatically apply it to any tuition and fees that are on your student account first. Then if there is any overage, we will send you what's called a refund. Uh, now the refund process is different depending on what school you go to, but it's basing, basically allowing you to have access to those federal or state or institutional monies after the semester has started to use for educational expenses. 
I think I mentioned earlier about a student who was paying their rent with student loans. Those refunds are to be used for educational purpose, purposes. And obviously housing is a big educational expense. You need to have a house over your head. You need to have internet so you can do your online classes. The last thing that I'm gonna talk about is even though you filled out your FAFSA, you got your financial aid, you're doing good, you have to maintain financial aid eligibility. Because remember, this is the state or the federal government that's lending you or giving you free money to go to school. So obviously they want you to do well in school. They want you to pass your classes and they wanna make sure you're not withdrawing from too many classes. So there are different things that the school will monitor at different times of the year to let you know what your financial aid status is. A lot of schools will call this satisfactory academic progress. It is completely separate from the school's academic standards, but really all you need to know is don't withdraw too much, don't fail and stay in your classes and you'll be good to go. All right, so I have talked for a very long time my contact information is on the screen and I am happy to answer any questions. I know, Kathy, I probably ran over on my time here, but. We're good. I know you also wanted to ask this question. Um, so I, I fired the poll. The, the challenge so many times financial aid offices have is how to reach the students. There, there may be information in email, there may be information in all different kinds of ways, and yet the students don't check it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you tell us, but keep in mind that the information is going to go to the student, not the parent, as Lee shared. And um, the financial aid office wants to know what, what the student's going to actually check. So, all right, the good news is personal email is still winning out. So that's good. We just need to make sure the students um, check it out text is is gaining ground okay i'm going to go ahead and, and close okay. this because i know we're running out of time and um i want to make sure we get to some some questions here so personal email is still winning out but text is gaining ground i don't think that surprises you um uh in terms of and a little bit letters but okay well very good thanks folks for for sharing that i do want to ask one of the questions that came in um from Valerie, because I, I, I do know some other families will have students applying to different types of schools. There's public schools, there's private schools. Mm -hmm. um, so Valerie asked, my son wants to go to a small private college. I've been told there's a second financial aid form, which of course is the CSS. So I don't want to get us too far down the rabbit hole, but I want you to at least mention that so the other families understand what that is. Yes. So that, and that's a good thing to bring up. Um, uh, there are, obviously there's the financial aid, the FAFSA, which handles any federal funding or state funding eligibility. Um, but then mostly private schools or other more expensive schools, if they give a lot of institutional funding out, they will actually have their own separate financial aid application. And that is something that's a little hard to talk about only because it's specific to what the school wants to ask you, but it's not something to be afraid of. It's just their version of the FAFSA that they will use to determine how much institutional funding that they are gonna award you. Right, and so I'm assuming they should just talk to their, the financial aid office of that institution. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Kenneth asks a, a great question, admissions, um, do the admissions letters come first before the college starts to process the FAFSA? That's a great question. Yeah. So it, that all depends on the school and the timing of when you complete the application to the school and when you complete the FAFSA. So here at Pitt, uh, we do not wait till you get accepted as a student because uh, I want to start processing all your financial aid information right away. Right. So you may actually hear from me before you hear from my admissions office. Some schools will do the opposite, where they will not start processing your financial aid until you've been accepted to the school. 
because they have a larger number of students, which means less FAFSAs that they have to work. But uh, that's a, it's a hard question to answer because it can be either or. The best bet is to just check with the school because they will give you a quick answer just like I did of, um, you, may be, you may be able to get information from us first before admissions. Great, great. Um, I, I know you touched on it briefly, but I saw another question come through, so I wanted to ask about it. If a parent does not have a social security number, um, what should they do? Obviously, some people have said, should they use a, the um, tax identification number? Yes, this is a, and I don't mean yes as in use the tax identification right. number. I mean, yes as in this is very common um, where parents may be undocumented or they may be what we consider an eligible non-citizen. Um, if the parent does not have a U.S. issued social security number, that is for everything, including work purposes, then they should enter all zeros in the social. Uh, the FAFSA does get run through the Department of Homeland Security. So that is not an issue. If that happens, we will automatically know that the parents are on some kind of different status or even undocumented in that case. Um, the, uh, the social security number for work purposes only should not be entered. The only time you're going to enter a different information, different number is if you have an alien registration number, then that would be put into the FAFSA uh, instead of the social security number. But when in doubt, put all zeros and we as the school will ask you for more information on the back end and update if necessary. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Mercy's asking that the app for the federal subsidized and unsubsidized loan has a message on it that they're not accepting applications at this time for the upcoming school year. Yeah. So if you're trying to apply for loans for the 23-24 year or the 24-25 year, your school, the school that you're interested in, has to make that available um, and it might be a little too early. We can't process student loans at this time for fall 23. So just give that a little bit of time. It might not be something that you could do for another couple of months now. Okay, great. Um, I know one question came in related to family debts and, and a question was sent in ahead of time related to that, that does credit score or you know credit worthiness, does that play a role in FAFSA completion and, and how their aid package is determined? I love this question because it does not. Your credit, whether it's the student or parent, your credit is not run. I don't know how else to say it, but we don't care about your credit. We don't care about the debt that you have. Now, if you have such significant debt that you need us to make an income adjustment, that's the only time when, when we will ask you for information like that. But just completing the FAFSA or student loans are not a credit-based process. The only credit, the, the only time that credit comes into a play is if as a parent, you are applying for a parent plus loan for the student. That is credit-based, but that is like, you know, once you complete the FAFSA and you get awarded financial aid, the loans go way down the list of things that we want you to take advantage of. So you don't start getting into any credit-based things until the parents are taking out loans. Yeah, great, thanks. So we are gonna wrap up now because we've, um, we are just shy of the seven o'clock hour and I wanna make sure you all know um, about some upcoming things. Uh, number one, week four, which is next week, we are going to be doing our final session in the series, which is comparing financial aid award letters. Again, as um, Lee started to talk about, when you're looking at those award letters from different institutions to your four-year private, they can look very different. So we're going to walk you through that next week. You don't want to miss that. Um, next up, CFNC is also offering a paying for grad school session on March 2nd. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about paying for grad, grad school, I encourage you to tune into that. For our Spanish speaking families, uh, they are doing a session on March 30th for helping my child cover college costs. So related topic there. Um, 
Also, we want to make sure you, you don't miss out on the third annual North Carolina HBCU Showcase, which is on February 22nd from 6 to 7.30. And for our Spanish-speaking families on March 2nd, we're going to be doing a session on helping your student take advantage of high school opportunities. So there's are coming up. I, of course, have to make one more plug for the FAFSA. I know some of you have students who are, who, um, are not going to college in the fall. Um, so you all know, but want to make sure that is one of the best ways to access uh, financial aid at the federal, state, and college level. So, you know, it, one form gets you considered for all three. So definitely don't miss out on that. We do have a whole section on the CFNC website under the pay section, which, which has all kinds of great information for you. We do actually have a recorded vi video that walks you step by step through completing the FAFSA. So if you haven't filled it out yet, it is there. Don't miss out on that. Um, finally, we've had a lot of folks ask us if we've been recording these sessions, which we have. We did on um, CFNC on their YouTube channel. We ha have already posted the first two sessions. We'll, we'll post this one as well, probably uh, early next week. Um, so don't miss out on that. Go back and listen to that. And with that, Lee, thank you so much for going through all this wonderful information with us. We really appreciate you. And for everyone, have a wonderful evening. We hope you found this session valuable. You will get an exit survey on your way out when you, when you click in. So thanks, y'all. Have a great night.